There is a Bible story of two kings and two coronations. A usurper to the throne attempts to steal the scepter of power. An angel with a golden censer standing beside the altar sends holy fire upon the earth. The biggest deceptions concerning the great king are dismantled. All illegitimate kingdoms are destroyed by a rock cut without hands as the beauty and strength of the unicorn shine forth. Finally, the king's scepter is restored to the throne. The subjects of the kingdom are made beautiful in the image of their Lord, and God's saints inherit the kingdom forever and ever. Welcome to Bible Revelations for the Last Generation, where the books are unsealed and the mysteries revealed to those who love His appearing. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Marla Ilana, and I'm representing DNJ TV, which stands for Destination New Jerusalem. We are a new Adventist television network dedicated and exclusively focused on present truth. We currently broadcast in Spanish on the island of Puerto Rico on channel 77.1. We also, by satellite, cover the entire Caribbean, Central America, and the northern countries of South America. I'm really thrilled to be with you today. And uh, we are beginning a new series of studies, and the series is called Bible Revelations for the Last Generation. And today's study in particular is called The Mystery of the Coronations. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach your word, to receive your word, to be illumined by your Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. We pray that he would be the teacher today. We pray that he would literally take us by the, the hand as children that we are, and that he will guide us into the deep mysteries of your word, whom you have reserved for the disciples. And we are your disciples, Father, by faith. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. So we start our study today with a question. And the question is, what if God had shaped the lives of his people in the Old and even the New Testament, as well as the sacred history of the church of the children of Israel, in order to give us, the last generation, a template or the pattern of end time events. In other words, did God really influence and possibly uh, help define and help determine and help shape the lives of his people so that the last generation would be able to see in their lives types and patterns and a chronology of end time events? That is a pretty um, amazing thought, but the answer is that yes, the Bible actually supports this. And we read this in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, where the Bible says, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And generally, when we read this verse, we understand about types and patterns. We understand that types are people, circumstances, or events, objects, also things that prefigure future people, things, events. We understand that admonition can be broader than just a warning. The word uh, nuthesia in Greek also means counsel, instruction. Um, so these things are written for our edification. And that's what we usually focus upon. And so we know that um, it is legitimate to say that in a certain way the Bible was written for the last generation. But what we seldom focus upon is the beginning of this verse, which is the amazing part of it, which says, all these things happen unto them for examples, which means that God deliberately molded the lives and shaves, shaped the lives of his people so as to prefigure end time events, and that these types, these shadows, these models, if you will, are not accidental. They are not a coincidence. They are actually, um, they were determined, predefined for our generation, for our benefit. So. 
I mean, these things were not only written for our benefit, they happened for our benefit. And I personally find that um, quite, quite astonishing. Now, the second biblical principle that we, we will be applying in our study today is one that Jesus taught us himself, which is that the entire Bible speaks of him. And we have two witnesses, John 5, 39, which says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And we get a second witness in Hebrews 10, verse 7, where Jesus, again speaking, says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So the entire Bible speaks of Jesus. Therefore, anything in the Bible um, that catches our attention, we should be asking ourselves, how does this uh, speak about Jesus? What is this revealing about Jesus? Finally, there's a third Bible principle that we'll be applying today, which is called the principle of symmetry and parallelism. And we apply this principle when the Holy Spirit is the one teaching. So let's read this in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 2, where the Bible says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. In other words, these are revelations of God to his children, things that are revealed, not things that are secret, not things that are concealed. So we are safely in the context of Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The revealed things belong unto us and our children forever. Now, the verse continues, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, um, first of all, we're saying these are not words of men. These are words of God. We're saying it is God himself who teaches us through the Holy Spirit. And the wisdom, therefore, is a higher wisdom that we of our own would not be able to attain onto except as the Holy Spirit guides us. So the Holy Spirit is the one who is going to show us correlations between parallel passage. He's going to help us identify common elements between one Bible story, another Bible story, one passage, another passage. And he will help us connect the dots between these passages so that one story or one passage in the Bible or one verse of scripture illumines another. And why does the Holy Spirit do this? Because certain Bible truths are quite complex. And therefore, as we can see here, the Holy Spirit is going to use a simple pattern, such as the sanctuary, the court, the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place, right? So we have the outer court, the two apartments, the sanctuary, and that plus the feasts are going to, uh, they create a sort of uh, macrocosm that represents the entire plan of salvation. So something which in itself has a little bit of complexity, but is not quite as complex as the entire plan of salvation. Same thing with the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, a simple, uh, a rather um, more simple metaphor, is going to teach the process of the judgment, which is a more complex process. So this is how the Holy Spirit teaches us, using something simple to reveal something more complex. Okay, so to summarize, three Bible principles. Number one, um, Bible history and the lives of Bible characters were shaped uh, in a predetermined fashion to prefigure end time events. And they were captured, recorded, registered for our benefit. Number two, the entire Bible teaches of Jesus, particularly about his closing work, since this is all um, uh, written for the benefit of uh, the last generation, right? And number three, we compare spiritual with spiritual so that as we compare um, Bible passages, we are able to understand deeper layers of truth that may not appear by simply considering one passage in isolation. Even if we're studying it in context, the fact of comparing it with another Bible passage is going to reveal um, more light and deeper layers of truth.
Now, having said all of this, I just wanted to lay the, the biblical foundation so that we now know that as we embark on our study today, we are on safe ground. We are, um, this is sound doctrine. And we are going to consider an Old Testament story that can turn, contains rather the pattern and the chronology of end time events. So let's start. As always in the Bible, there is going to be more than one witness, right? So we have two versions of the same story. The story begins in one of its versions in 1 Chronicles 21, and it carries through, uh, through 2 Chronicles 7. And the other version of the story is found in 2 Samuel 24, and it carries through until 1 Kings 8. The story begins with King David numbering the people, and then... It carries through a succession of a variety of events. It's, a, it's an allegory, so it's a, a long story. And then it ends with Solomon building and dedicating the first temple. In this allegory, King David represents God the Father, and Solomon represents Jesus. Now, what's interesting about this story is that it begins with a common stem. So there are certain events which are common to both versions of the story. So we begin like this. But when we reach, after we uh, consider the fourth event in the story, then the two stories branch out, and each version of the story is going to uh, provide different details. And they're, they're each one is going to be very rich in details, but they're going to take us in slightly different directions. However, they do corrobor corroborate each other. So let's get started. David numbers the people of Israel and Judah. And one Bible version says, it is Satan who moved David. And the other Bible version says, it is God who used Satan to move David. Uh, second event is that God is displeased with um, the numbering. Um, he didn't think that David needed to do that. He just, David just needed to trust in the Lord. So God wants to uh, teach David a lesson and gives him a choice of three punishments that he can choose from. He can choose from the sword, he can choose from the famine, or he can choose from the pestilence. And David chooses uh, the pestilence. He preferred to uh, cast himself into the arms of the Lord versus to be uh, persecuted by his enemies or to have the people die of the famine. Next event in the chronology is that there was an angel who was standing above Jerusalem with a sword in his hand, ready to destroy the city of Jerusalem, a very dramatic event. And now the Lord uh, retains the arm of the angel so that the angel will not destroy Jerusalem. And the angel speaks to David through the prophet Gad and instructs David to build an altar on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, and the other version says Arana, the Jebusite. That's the uh, Aramaic version of the name. So David uh, proceeds to be obedient, right? He wants God to stay the plague. And finally, the fourth event of the common stem of uh, the two stories, David now offers a sacrifice to the Lord on Mount Moriah, which is now called Temple Mount. And God answers by fire, demonstrating that God is pleased with the sacrifice. So what we're going to do, and this is the exercise we're now going to start um, to carry out here, we're going to take each event and we're going to quickly see how does this event prefigure an event in the end time chronology. So let's begin. So the counting of the people has a, um, a, a parallel event in the end time chronology, which is the numbering of the 144,000. So we see two numberings of people. That's in Revelation 7. When God gives David a choice and David chooses the pestilence, the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles 21 that pestilence is the sword of the Lord. So this is telling us that the pestilence was a punishment. God was um, not pleased with Israel. He wasn't pleased with David either. And so, if you will, in punishment to both of them, uh, the Lord sends the pestilence. So that is the Lord who is behind this. In the third event, which is um, building an altar on the threshing floor of Mount Moriah, what is this pointing to? Well, threshing floor is a place where the wheat is separated from the chaff, the wheat 
separate it from the tares. In other words, a threshing floor is a place of sifting. The sifting of God's people begins at this point, and this is uh, prefiguring the judgment of the living. There's a judgment now that begins, and it begins at the house of God, 1 Peter 4, 17. Now, the fourth event that happens in the common branch between the two versions of the story is that David offers a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is a place, um, is the place where Abraham had offered his son Isaac, was about to offer his son Isaac to the Lord, and the Lord stayed, well, the Lord working through an angel, right? The Lord sent an angel, the angel of the Lord, to stop Abraham from uh, slaying his son. So you see the parallels here um, with angels. And this uh, Mount Moriah is a place where the 144,000 um, are associated with this place. And so this event is prefiguring when the 144,000 are offered before the Lord as a living sacrifice on the altar, and God sends fire from heaven to anoint them, to confirm that he is well pleased with the sacrifice and that his, um, his holy fire is coming down to give them the special anointing that will help them and empower them uh, to perform their uh, very special mission in the time of the end. So this is these are the common events in the two stories. And as we now uh, branch out into one of the versions, we're going to start with the version in Chronicles. I'm going to ask you to now be listening actively and in your minds trying to uh, see if you can um, uh, map the correspondence between the event that's described in the Old Testament story and what event that might be pointing to in the chronology of the time of the end. So let's begin. After the 144,000 are offered on the altar, right? We're going back now to the allegory. David makes Solomon king over Israel the first time. This is very important. There will be a second anointing of Solomon as king. But right now, King David makes Solomon king over Israel for the first time. First decree, first anointing. David begins preparation for the first temple. He begins to gather, gather precious uh, metals. And David, who had received from the Holy Spirit the blueprint to build the temple, as you may recall, uh, Moses was given the pattern um, of the tabernacle. He, it was shown him on the mount how the tabernacle needed to be built. Every detail had been spelled out by the Lord. In the same way, God spelled out every detail. There was a, a fine uh, and very detailed blueprint of the new temple. Uh, as you know, David was not allowed to build the temple. However, David received the blueprint, and he did begin to reorganize the house of God. According to the pattern given in heaven, David begins to reorganize the uh, temple services. Solomon now is made king the second time. So this is the second anointing of Solomon as king. And now Solomon sits on his father's throne. Solomon prepares to build the temple. Work is begun. The temple is completed. All this happens over a period of years. I'm um, summarizing and we're going through this uh, fairly quickly but i invite you at uh, your own leisure to go back to the old testament and read the story the temple is finally completed the ark of the testament is brought in the shekinah glory fills the temple and at this point the priest can no longer minister so the priests need to leave the temple because the glory of the Lord, the glorious cloud of the Shekinah glory is filling the temple. Solomon offers a prayer of dedication, de dedicating the temple to the Lord. Fire from comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifices. And the people return home after 14 days of feasting. There were seven days of uh, feasting for the dedication of the temple, followed by seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, which lasts seven days. So now let's quickly try to correlate these events with the end time events in the final segment of time. So the first anointing of Solomon comes after 
the beginning of the judgment, which in the end time chronology is indicated to us by the national Sunday law being proclaimed in the United States. So there is an event that is not um, clearly um, identified in the chronology, except as it is illustrated by the threshing floor, which as we said is a, is a, a symbol rather representing judgment. So uh, David makes, king, uh, son, makes his uh, son king over Israel, first anointing. This is pointing to Jesus being proclaimed king for the first time. This is the first proclamation of Jesus as king, first anointing, and the early reign falls now on God's people. This is signaling the close of probation for God's people because those who do not receive the rain um, is an indication that they have been sifted out of the church. God at this point begins to make preparation for the post-shaking Seventh-day Adventist church, the church that will go forth a glorious church, the church militant becomes church glorious, and the church is reorganized according to a divine pattern to be more efficient, to have more heavenly power, more authority, to go and fill the earth with God's glory, proclaim the three angels' messages with power from heaven, give the loud cry, bring as many out of Babylon as are willing to come out of Babylon, and then uh, finally, the time of grace for the world closes. And uh, this is indicated to us by Solomon being made king the second time. What is happening in heaven? What is this prefiguring, this event of Solomon being uh, made king the second time? This is pointing to Michael standing up in heaven in Daniel 12, verse 1. Michael is standing up in heaven. Uh, Michael is um, proclaiming judgment against the wicked. What happens next is that the mystery of God finishes. In other words, probation closes. The leaders of iniquity have filled the cup of their iniquity. Um, probation closes on them and on the world. Their judgment has been proclaimed in heaven. At this point, the seventh trumpet begins to blow. So after probation, mystery of God finishes, and now the seventh trumpet blows. Jesus is anointed king the second time. And what happens? as happened at the first coronation, as happened in the apostolic days when Jesus was anointed as high priest and the Holy Spirit of his anointing was like the oil that fell down his beard, down his tunic and down upon the um, upper room where the disciples were gathered together. We're, well, in the same way here, the oil of God's Holy Spirit is going to fall down at this point upon the 144,000 who are still standing. This is the end of time. Uh, the saints have been through the three and a half years of, of persecution. The latter rain falls on them to prepare them for the great uh, time of trouble, Jacob's time of trouble. And at this point, the plagues begin to fall. So we have a perfect parallel um, when probation closes, Jesus is anointed and two things begin to happen. The plagues begin to fall on the wicked and the Holy Spirit in the form of the latter rain now falls on the people of God that are still standing. Now, um, when the temple is uh, completed, the ark brought in, Shekinah glory fills the temple, all this is pointing to as we said, the close of probation, but the temple being filled with God's glory represents not only the fact that the priest can no longer minister, which is the case, but it also represents the fact that the number of God's kingdom is complete. God's kingdom is numbered. The saints of all the ages from Adam down, all of this great, great, great multitude uh, from all the ages constitutes the number of the kingdom of God. So the number now is completed. Um, God's kingdom, all of his subjects are identified. Uh, obviously, the wicked will remain wicked. The unjust, the filthy, they will remain unjust and filthy. Jesus now offers a prayer of dedication um, of his people to the Father. Now, we don't have a, um, a model of this 
prayer. We don't have a corresponding prayer in the book of Revelation where Jesus would do this, but we do have the beautiful prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17. Remember where Jesus is interceding on behalf of the disciples and Jesus offers a beautiful prayer of dedication of his disciples to the Lord. So this is uh, a similar event at the end of time. Jesus is now dedicating all of the subjects of his kingdom to the Lord before he brings all of us with him back to heaven. Now this prayer takes place in heaven because what happens now is that Jesus arrives, fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, consumes the wicked. Now this is a wicked um, sacrifice being consumed. This is the um, evil supper. There's the marriage supper of the lamb, but there's the evil supper where the fowls of the air are eating up all the wicked. Um, so that's what this is pointing to. Um, Jesus comes to the earth in flames of fire, in fiery chariots, uh, with a sword in his mouth, and um, all of the dead are consumed because they cannot endure the glory of the Lord. At this point, the people of the Lord who have waited for Jesus, who traveled over seven days. Now the people of God are going to be escorted by angels and together with Jesus, we're going to travel back um, to heaven for seven days and there will be a great feast in heaven as well. So this is a beautiful, amazing um, allegory uh, where we see how Old Testament events and the lives of uh, characters like King David and King Solomon prefigure the chronology of end time events. But it gets better. There's even more richness to this story. So let's now consider the second version of the story, which we find in 2 Samuel 24, and as we said, carries through 1 Kings. Now, I want you to pay special attention here because um, there is a revelation about this condition of the church at the end of time. So I want you to listen carefully now. So remember, after the common stem of events, now we're going to branch out into the second version of the story where King David can get no heat. King David is now in his um, elderly uh, years and um, he is constantly cold. So those who surround King David, he, the, the men of his court, uh, find a beautiful young virgin. Her name was Abishag. And they bring this beautiful damsel to King David so that she will minister to him and she will keep him warm. Now, the Bible says that King David knew her not. He knew her not. That means carnally, he did not um, touch her, engage with her carnally in any way. Now, what's interesting about Abishag is that her name means father of error. So I want you to ponder that father of error, ponder that, and let's continue, but I want you to store that in a little corner of your mind. Now, another dramatic event takes place. Adonijah, who is the fourth son of King David, lays claim to David's throne. Now, Adonijah is a usurper of the throne because he had not been appointed to become king of Israel. That was going to be King Solomon. But King Solomon had not yet been anointed king. No proclamation had been made. Um, so Adonijah decided that he was going to take over the throne. So Adonijah uh, comes to Jerusalem, proclaims himself to be king, heir to the throne, and he slays a very, very large amount of sheep and oxen and cattle. So there is a great, great, great sacrificial offering um, presumably to the Lord. Nathan the prophet, um, who uh, was a faithful uh, supporter of King David, comes to Queen, Queen Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and tells her what's happening in the city with Adonijah, because Adonijah had taken with him a certain number of, of faithful servants of David, presumably uh, faithful servants, abandon uh, King David's court, and they go with Adonijah. So at this point, David being warned, Queen Bathsheba warns David, and they, they entreat David to, to um, quickly, very quickly, anoint Solomon king, or they're all going to be in a lot of trouble if Adonijah actually gets to sit on the throne. So David orders that three of his men bring Solomon on a mule and anoint him king. So the priest takes oil from the tabernacle, anoints Solomon king, the trumpet is blown, and the people rejoice. 
Now, what happens when uh, Adonijah, who had gone to a, a room to have a banquet with his supporters, Adonijah hears the great uproar in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there were all kinds of noises, trumpets blowing, shouts, celebrations, and someone, a messenger, comes to tell Adonijah that, um, in fact, Solomon has been proclaimed king. When Adonijah hears these evil tidings, for him these were evil tidings, Adonijah clamps on to the horns of the altar. First of all, all of his supporters desert him. Adonijah is left alone. So Adonijah goes into the temple and he literally clamps on to the horns of the altar. And remember that in the Bible, horns represent power. So we're going to see uh, momentarily what this is pointing to at the time of the end. But he's, he's clamped on. He will not let go of the horns of the altar. Solomon comes, but Solomon lets him go. Solomon does not uh, prosecute him or have him jailed or have him uh, slain. No, he lets him go in peace. At this point, um, King David is requesting that Solomon um, perform justice upon some evil men who had um, notably uh, killed. They had, they had shed a lot of blood. And one of them was Joab, who used to head up the military um, in King David's government. So just before King David dies, he asked Solomon if he will, he will please execute judgment on some of these people. Solomon is now established as king. And... Uh, Adonijah, um, not, I guess not measuring what he was doing, comes to Queen Bathsheba and asks Queen Bathsheba if she would please intercede for him on his behalf before King Solomon to ask King Solomon for the hand of Abishag, the young virgin who used to minister to King David. At this point, Solomon is totally enraged. He, um, he simply instructs Benaiah, who he, whom he had appointed head of the military of his army, um, he instructs Benaiah to slay Adonijah. So this is the end of Adonijah. He is slain. Uh, Solomon also deals with all the wicked men, just as King David had, had um, requested that he do. So he casts out the, the priest. He casts out Joab, and Joab also is slain. And after all of these deaths that were, um, you know, the state executing justice, uh, as the Bible says, Solomon marries Pharaoh's daughter. As we all know, God had given Solomon great wisdom to judge. Solomon's government at this point is in place. He has gotten rid of all of his enemies. His kingdom is fully established. His, uh, all his officials have been confirmed in their roles. And as we know, Solomon was a man of great wisdom and understanding. He begins to make preparation to build the temple. And the story ends in 1 Kings 8, where it tells us that so it takes Solomon seven years to build the temple. is beginning with this numbering of the 144,000. We know that judgment begins at the house of God. The judgment, as we know, is closely associated with the National Sunday Law because the National Sunday Law is the final test for God's people, as it is for the world as well. It's a final obedience test. And once um, each one of us has been tested, probation for the church will close. So the um, outpouring of the rain, which points to Jesus being anointed king in heaven, is also telling us that probation is closed. The rain falling means probation is closed. Whoever has not received the rain has been sifted out of the church. Those who receive the rain, they are God's people and they will be saved. So very important that we prepare for this event. 
Now, what we're going to see in, a, in one of our uh, upcoming studies in this series is that the appearing of Satan and the National Sunday Law will happen on the very same day. That's a big conversation, and we will have that conversation in, as I said, in an upcoming study. Now, important to realize, and the reason I'm stressing this, is because Satan will appear before the rain falls. God's people will not have been sealed when Satan appears. So it is extremely important that we protect ourselves, that we, uh, I, because I've heard um, some of God's people saying, oh, it doesn't matter when Satan will come because we'll be, we'll be sealed. He comes, he comes very late. He comes after. In fact, some teachings uh, would have it that Satan appears after the close of probation. Brothers and sisters, this is not biblical. We're going to have a study where, where I will show um, and share with you all the evidence as to when exactly Satan is going to appear, because the Bible is very clear about that. And it is certainly not after the close of probation. So we need to be very, very watchful, very vigilant. And whoever receives the wrong spirit will not be able to receive God's Holy Spirit and will be lost. So this is a very important warning that I just want to, um, to bring up at this point. Now, just to emphasize the fact that the latter rain falls at the seventh trumpet, the latter rain falls at the final kingdom proclamation and the second anointing of Jesus as king. And this is concurrent, as we said, with close of probation with the world. In, well, rather, Michael stands up, probation closes for the world, and shortly after that, um, then Jesus is anointed king at the seventh trumpet. So there's a very short interval of time between Michael standing up, probation closing, and then the proclamation of the kingdom and the second anointing of Jesus as king. As we said, and I want to stress this point, the latter reign now has the purpose of sealing the saints in holy perfection for eternity. We're going to see uh, more of that in our very next study. And then uh, the saints will be strengthened by the power of God's spirit to endure the time of trouble of Jacob's time of trouble and be able to stand without an intercessor until Jesus comes back to the earth. And then, um, as we said, it is um, the sad, the very sad reality that our church is uh, lukewarm, but we understand the root cause. And what encourages me about this is that we can do something about it. If we understand the root cause of a problem, we can solve it. So our job is to is to pray. Our job is to pray and to share this message. I encourage you to share this message with as many people as you can because the church needs to come out of error. It is error, error that is keeping our church in her lukewarm condition. And if we don't wake up the church, many will be lost. And that includes a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders um, who are simply not teaching sound doctrine. And uh, many little sheep will be lost unless we do something about it. So this is an appeal to you to, uh, if you have been, um, if you feel you have been enlightened by this story, edified by this, um, this study, I pray that you would share this and, um, and, and, and do everything, do your utmost um, in prayer and diligently sharing the message so that God's people may wake up and not be surprised by the, um, the appearing of Satan on the scene and by the National Sunday Law. So to conclude, God wrote the Bible with the last generation in mind. But he didn't just write the Bible for the last generation. He shaped the course of history. This is what really um, just blows me away. He shaped the lives of his people detail by detail, influencing the course of events. God never violates our freedom of choice. Our free will is the one thing, I mean, God is a very respectful God, but there's one thing that he treasures above all things is free will, and that we love him and we obey him of our own free will. It's our choice to do so. So within that respect, those boundaries of respecting people's will, God influenced and helped to shape and helped to mold the lives of his people and 
the history of the church so as to prefigure end time events for our benefit, for our instruction. So that is a demonstration of his power of his wisdom and of his great love. And these revelations that are concealed in his word, but that are now coming to light as the Holy Spirit is shedding light on these beautiful, precious truths, it's a token of love. It's a token of love. We need to receive it with an open heart. And through his Holy Spirit, God is trying to instruct us so that he can prepare us in holiness. God is preparing us so that through the instruction of his Holy Spirit, through the power of his Holy Spirit, by helping us to die to self daily, by helping us to put to death the old man, allow Jesus to live in us and through us, God is preparing us to receive the seal so that we may receive the early and the latter rain and dwell with him throughout all eternity. What a beautiful and wonderful God we serve. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God. So let's pray and let's thank our Heavenly Father for these beautiful blessings. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this beautiful Old Testament story that you designed in heaven with your perfect foreknowledge of future events. You designed this beautiful story. You led King David, King Solomon, Queen Bathsheba, and all the characters that take place or that take part in this story. Father, you guided their lives. You guided um, the, the, the sequencing of events and all of this for the benefit of the last generation. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you our love, we give you our hearts, we give you our obedience. And we pray that you would help us to be diligent, to seek you diligently, cast out any lukewarmness, cast out anything, dear Lord, that would separate us from you. And please make us holy, make us holy, make us like Jesus, that we may be prepared for the seal and the rain and that we may dwell with you forever eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Thank you for watching Bible Revelations for the Last Generation, produced by DNJ TV. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any questions related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at dnj.tv. To find out more, visit our website at dnj.tv.